So the learning objectives for this brief moment we're going to spend, spend together uh, will be to know briefly what breast cancer is, what are the origins and stages of breast cancer, uh, what are the signs and symptoms and how can we reduce our risk of developing uh, breast cancer. So the anatomy of uh, the breast, and again you can see this is as basic as it will be. So the breast is mainly uh, fat, uh, and that's very important because the amount of fat in the breast sometimes determines how dense the breast is. So you have, so someone that has a lot of fat in the breast uh, will be a little more in doubt than someone that has less, you know, uh, fat uh, in the breast. So you have uh, the, the glands that secretes uh, the uh, milk and you have tubes that looks like pipe that brings it to like the outlet which is the nipple and these are all surrounded by fat. Inside this you have what we call the stroma elements like the blood vessels like connective tissues, those are the, the pipes that keeps also the breast uh, in shape. As we all know, fat uh, is, you know, can be liquid, depend on the temperature, but you need some other structures to keep it in place. The other connective tissue elements and blood vessels are important because you probably have someone, you know, when we say breast cancer, we're talking mainly breast cancer. But other things can occur in the breast. Um, the way I explain to uh, the grandmother or the elderly person or the lay person that comes to my office sometimes is every one of us goes to the gas station to buy gas. Think about the breast as a gas station. Under the ground, you have tanks where the gas is stored. Those are like the lobos and the glands. And then you have tubes that carry the gas from those tanks to the pump where you pump it out. And the reason I always use that to explain things is that it's easier then when I now start talking about the differentiation between uh, DCIS, that is breast cancer in situ, an invasive cancer. Because then I can say that if you have a rusty tank on the ground, gas is not leaking into the surrounding uh, soil or you know whatever you have. That is like what we call the CIS. It's just the abnormal proliferation of cells that are still confined within uh, like a balloon. So they don't spread. So if somebody should light a fire, not a good idea at the gas station, but if you light a fire then it's not going to catch fire because the gas is still within that and it's not leaking. It's not going to go into the surrounding pipe and float to like the lymph node or anything like that. Then the next thing I say is that, you know, after surgery, and I'm digressing a little, after surgery, the people will say, uh, I'm just trying to complete the analogy so you will understand what I'm saying. You so say, why are we radiating the entire breast? Or why are we doing tamoxifen? I say, yes. Remember I said it's a rusty tank. If you take a small part of that rusty tank that is really causing trouble, you probably want to coat the entire tank. And that's what the radiation is doing to the rest of the breast. And uh, the tamoxifen that you are using is, since you don't want to take out the entire tank, uh, which you can do, uh, you can try and rejuvenate or uh, slow down the process that has been going on. Even though one part of the rust is uh, significantly more than the rest, you try to take care of the entire tank. Now, when you have a leakage, and gas is now spilling into the surrounding soil. That's like invasive breast cancer. It's now invading. And the same thing like breast. If you have a small leakage, 
is still confined to the breast, uh, you can go there, repair what is left, and give radiation maybe. It has not, it's not, the, the leakage is not that much that it flows into the pipes and go to the lymph nodes. The same thing like breast cancer. When you have a small cancer that is just leaking into the surrounding tissue, even though it's invasive, it will not spread. Uh, and that's why most breast cancer will start from, you know, very early stage, lymph node, and then the rest of the body. That analogy will probably carry us through the entire talk as we go. So, um, Breast cancer, uh, in terms of numbers, there, are about, there is over 200,000, almost a quarter million, diagnosed every year. It's actually the uh, most common cancer in women. And about 40,000 40, of uh, women die from breast cancer. In, and this number has been, even though it's been going down, it's, it's usually around that number uh, every year. Uh, second only to lung cancer. Lung cancer is still the number one uh, cause of cancer mortality in women in the United States. Uh, our state is doing a lot of things about curbing cigarette smoking uh, and hopefully someday we'll hear that lung cancer is not number one killer uh, anymore. With regards to breast cancer, the incidence and mortality has also been decreasing over years over the years. And the reason we thought the breast cancer mortality started dropping like from 2001, something like that, was because uh, less women are now using postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. Uh, and that's a topic we can go into. It's not as controversial as it used to be. We now know that uh, long-term postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy is a risk factor for, uh, for, for breast cancer. In terms of mortality, many things have improved that. Early screening, mammography decreased breast cancer mortality by about 50%. You go by the uh, Sweden study uh, and other randomized controlled trials that we have done. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I said I'm going to talk as if I'm talking to my grandmother. Um, the other things that made the uh, number of people dying from breast cancer, what we call mortality, to decrease apart from screening is that we now diagnose breast cancer at an earlier stage. The Survivor now is over 95 percent if you diagnose breast cancer at stage zero or stage one, and treatments are better. Uh, there are different types of treatment from better surgery, better radiation, better endocrine therapy, and uh, chemotherapy. Almost 14 billion dollars is still spent yearly on the treatment of uh, breast cancer in the United States alone. In terms of numbers still, the, the incidence of breast cancer is not less in African Americans, but the mortality, numbers dying, is 1.5 to twice that of uh, the Caucasian population. And this is usually because of many reasons. Uh, lower socioeconomic status, differential in treatment, uh, screening, and late, especially later stage at the diagnosis uh, of cancer. And uh, I mentioned before that uh, five-year survival is over 95% uh, when cancer is diagnosed at an earlier stage. So people ask all the time, why did, why did I get this? How did I get this? Uh, there is nobody in the family that have cancer. So the normal cells in the body 
Uh, we have trillions of cells in our body. They have what we call program. They grow and then they die. They divide, they die. Through a process called apoptosis. Programmed cell death. So if something is not dying and is still dividing, then uh, that's pretty much what cancer is. It's, provide, it's producing a lot of cells that look like itself. But instead of them dying, they are not dying. So they keep accumulating and growing fast and taking over whatever they can take over. Because they don't even behave normally. They don't look like normal cells at the end of the day. And that is what uh, cancer is. When we talk about breast cancer, just like I uh, mentioned before, it could be confined to the ducts and not spreading to the surrounding tissue, just like I mentioned about the tank uh, under the ground. Uh, the lobules or the ducts are supposed to be uh, lined by a single columnar cells, but you now start seeing those cells multiplying and filling those balloons. Sometimes they grow very fast. That this, the ones in the center, because blood supply to, let's say this is a balloon, comes from the periphery. So the ones in the center don't get as much blood supply. And that's when they start dying. Uh, you might hear what pathologists would call uh, central necrosis or comedo type uh, DCIS. It just means that it's filling very rapidly and the center uh, part are, are dying off. But because it's still contained within that lobos, they don't spread. Uh, now, you may have somebody that come and say, well, the doctor said I have DCIS. But then they did a lymph node, which we don't usually recommend. If someone has a DCIS, only on very few circumstances should a, DC, should a sentinel node be done. It doesn't spread. There is no need to do sentinel node. But there are individuals that will have extensive DCIS such that when you biopsy, there are other parts of the uh, breast that may have invasive cancer. And if the pathologist did not catch that, they can come back later with metastatic disease or something, very rare circumstances. That's the only way you can say DCIS, but it's not the DCIS, is that there is an invasive component uh, somewhere. So DCIS is localized, doesn't spread, does not need sentinel nodes. Uh, Sentinel node is the type of lymph node that you inject a dye, you go to the, the lymph node that uh, the dye goes to first, they, they check it, and if that doesn't have cancer, you don't need to go further like you, we used to do and take out the entire lymph node. Uh, sticking with this slide, this CIS is cancer inside, is inside too. Some people call it stage zero. Uh, and some believe that we should not even be using the word cancer for it because it's, it sometimes sends the wrong signal and people go more aggressive and get mastectomy and get sentinel node and get you know more treatment than they should uh, ordinarily get. There are circumstances where somebody will have DCIS and people may still do sentinel node. Now, when you do surgery for, for DCIS, it's just lumpectomy without no dissection. So if you go in, and now, when the pathologist is now looking at the entire tissue, because you know the first thing they did is a biopsy, it shows DCIS. Now when they do the real surgery and they now find, oh, there is an invasive cancer, there is microinvasion, they will go back and do a sentinel node. That's for the invasive component, not for the DCIS. However, there are some circumstances where you think, instead of going back for a surgery the second time, it is acceptable to do sentinel node in some circumstances. And those ones will be 
very extensive DCIS. I've seen people with uh, DCIS that is like five centimeters. You know that the pathologist is not going to break low all those five centimeters uh, accurately. So sometimes you do that. Two, if you're doing a mastectomy for a DCIS, so sometimes instead of this happening only in one spot, just think about that tank. You have rust, rust, rust everywhere. So that's what they call multicentric involvement of the breast. So it involves more than one quadrant. By the time you do a lumpectomy here, lumpectomy here, you've already done mastectomy. So sometimes they can treat a DCIS that is multicentric, or if it's more than five centimeter, or if you know, uh, if the ratio of breast that will be left behind is so small because that this is in a very small breasted person, then you will be doing mastectomy. If you are doing mastectomy in somebody, you should do sentinel node before you take out the entire breast because you don't know what you will find. If you find an invasive cancer there, you cannot do sentinel node because there is nowhere to inject the dye. So I will rephrase that. So for DCIS, you don't really need a sentinel node. But there are a few instances, very extensive DCIS, multicentric DCIS, that you're going to treat with mastectomy. Yes, because you can't go back and do sentinel node. If you are taking somebody's entire breast out for DCIS, you might as well do sentinel node. Or, this is a high grade, uh, young patient, very extensive, then you can discuss that we should do sentinel node, otherwise if we find invasive cancer, we'll have to go back for the second surgery. This is less than 5% of the cases. For the remaining everyday DCIS diagnosis, sentinel node biopsy should not be done. And the NCCN guideline, that is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, 2015, they have upgraded their recommendation actually not to do sentinel nodes routinely for DCIS. So when you're talking about invasive cancer, now think about now you have a leakage into the surrounding soil or breast tissue. Uh, and depending on the size, so if you think about it, if you have just a pinpoint leakage, it probably won't spread because it will not seep to the pipe that will take it to the lymph node. But if you have a huge leakage, before you even stop it, it's already getting into those pipes. The same thing with the breast. If you have a big tumor, aggressive tumor, the, uh, uh, it's more likely to, 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 to spread. So once it starts spreading into the surrounding tissue, that's when you use the word invasive cancer and for those you usually uh, expect that it may spread somewhere else. Um, we have two types. If it's starting in the duct, they call it ductal. If it's in the lobular, if it's in the lobes or the pipes, they call it lobular. Uh, there is no real big difference uh, between the two of them in terms of how we treat them. So how do we stage breast cancer? The, like most cancer, uh, the AJCC, the American Joint Cancer Commission, is what we, we do. And that's, that's because people see cancer as a surgical disease. So you now stage it based on anatomy. And when you're talking about anatomy, you're talking about the breast, in this case, the lymph node, and then distant organ. So that's anatomy. That's how you treat it. So if it's confined to the breast, it's a small, uh, so we use TNA. The tumor, that is the size, the N, uh, which is the node, and N, metastasis. Then you add up, and that's how you come up with the stage. So if you have a small T1, uh, you have T1, T2, T3, uh, T4, N1, N2, N3, and then M0, M1. 
So if it's confined to the breast, it's stage one. Stage two is a bigger uh, tumor, but has not spread to the lymph node. And stage three, you have regional disease uh, involving most many times multiple lymph nodes. And stage four, it has already left the breast and the regional lymph node and have spread to the other parts of the body, uh, lung, brain, liver, bone, uh, and sometimes skin. And this is important because many times when cancer has spread to other organs, we don't cure it, especially if it's diffuse uh, for breast cancer. Because for lymphoma, you can still cure it. But if it's regional, the chance of cure is still very good. Um, this is mainly anatomy, and it's, it kind of puts everybody in the same basket. Because you may have a stage 3 cancer that is not as aggressive as a stage 1 cancer sometimes, or stage 2. So when we see patients, we don't really even put too much emphasis on you are stage 1, stage 2, stage 3. I tell people because they want to know. But what is more important in terms of treatment and prognosis are things like the size of the tumor. Any tumor greater than two centimeters is one we should be worried about, risk of distance spread. And the reason why these factors are important is those are the individuals you may want to consider treating with chemotherapy that goes through the whole body. So size matters when you talk about breast cancer. Uh, the grade of the tumor. The grade is not the same thing as the stage, but you have grade one, grade two, grade three. The pathologists make use of three different uh, characteristics of the tumor in terms of is it trying to form tubes, are cells dividing, uh, they call it the Nottingham criteria. They put this together to have grade one, grade two, grade three. Grade one means when they look at the slide, it's, it's still looking like non regular cells. Stage two is in between, they see some cells dividing, but stage three, you start seeing the membranes going left and right, and you see the nucleus dividing, what they call uh, mitosis, they see. That's really aggressive, so you have stage grade one, grade two, grade three. So size is important, grade is important. Lymph node status is very important. If uh, cancer has already spread to a lymph node, doesn't matter if it's small. That is when size don't matter. That is telling you already, this is going to be aggressive. It's already spread to lymph node. So one of the, probably the most significant uh, of the prognostic factors is lymph node status. Uh, if you have a tumor that is five centimeter and it's not gone anywhere, it's not as bad as one that is 0.5 centimeter and is already <coughs> spreading to lymph nodes. The receptor expression is very important. So, uh, if you have a tumor that is ER, PR, uh, strongly positive, most times, apart from the fact that you have a target that you can treat, uh, they are not as aggressive as one that are ER, PR negative. Then you have what they call the R2 expression also. And tumors that overexpress R2 new uh, are more uh, aggressive than those that don't. So if they don't express any, what we call triple negative, bad actor. If they express the R2 new, bad actor. Uh, there are other things we do, but uh, I, I, I'm not sure you know, it's relevant for this talk. So the, I, I already talked about the receptor status. The most common type will be the ERPR positive and two new negative. Probably about 75% of breast cancer will be like that. And then it also depends on the population too. The actual new overexpressing breast cancer 
will be about 25% uh, and can be higher in some population is common in African Americans. Uh, though I heard recently that uh, it's not really a racial thing, but a socioeconomic. Uh, so if you decide to analyze women that grew up poorer, then they, they probably have higher uh, incidence of triple negative. I've not seen that paper myself. Um, triple negative, I talked about inflammatory breast cancer. Is another type of breast cancer that uh, has poor prognosis and treatment for this will usually go very aggressive. So what is inflammatory breast cancer? It is actually a clinical pathologic diagnosis. So it's not a diagnosis that you... So clinical, somebody comes with a red inflamed breast with what they call orange peel appearance. Old orange. Uh, that, until proven otherwise, is inflammatory breast cancer. The breast is big, you think this is a mastitis. But then the biopsy, they say this is breast cancer. When the pathologist will look at it under the slide, they will see cancer cells already invading into the lymph node and the blood vessel. That is why it's a clinical pathologic diagnosis. But the clinical is very important. These days, some things I, I, we now see is like if you do an MRI, you see enhancement of the skin. And you can see that on mammogram also. Even if you treat and the redness and everything goes away, because many times you can't feel a mass, you can't feel a, you can't, you can't feel a lump in inflammatory breast cancer. The treatment is still mastectomy. You take out the entire breast because if not, it's going to come back with a fungating lesion in the chest wall most of the time. So we do mastectomy, chemotherapy, and radiation. Usually you start with chemo, then surgery, then radiation for, the, for that. Paget disease of the breast is uh, usually not a big uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's almost like a DCIS. Uh, the only thing which I'm going to is that you see a scaly appearance of the breast and then in the biopsy they see uh, that they are, this person has Paget disease of the breast. It is, the, 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 the thing about it is that it can be associated with breast cancer within the, the breast itself, either DCIS or, or invasive cancer. So when we see Paget disease of the breast, sometimes they usually will do mastectomy if they can't find, but in these days of MRI, you are able to find the accompanying uh, DCIS or invasive cancer uh, within the breast. Sometimes, because the Paget disease mostly at, uh, is around the nipple, they do what they call central lumpectomy. They just take out the central part of the breast because the accompanying uh, breast uh, carcinoma in situ or invasive is usually around that if it's if, because it's common in older people most times you don't want to do complete mastectomy uh, for them so treatment options i've been touching these as uh, we're going on so surgery is still a mainstay for breast cancer Yes, most times you do it sequentially, surgery, but there are times when somebody presents with a very big cancer, you can feel lymph node, you know this is locally advanced, you do scan the whole body, you are not seeing anything. We start with chemo sometimes because that person, biggest risk is not the local disease. It's the cancer that will come back in the brain, in the lungs, in the liver, or the bone. So you start with uh, chemotherapy in this situation, that will also downsize the local uh, breast disease and the lymph node. Uh, and then radiation. Uh, when breast cancer treatment was mainly surgical, you do 
mastectomy with removal of pectoralis muscle and a lot of lymph nodes, those have changed. Uh, and uh, in 1991, I believe NCI came with a uh, uh, statement that uh, lumpectomy plus radiation is equal to mastectomy. So the, the exact word was that uh, breast conservation therapy is, uh, uh, is, is an acceptable alternative to mastectomy. Uh, so these days, people don't necessarily have to do uh, mastectomy. In fact, there was a paper, very controversial paper in uh, uh, the Cancer Journal a couple years ago, stating that uh, women actually do better with breast conservative therapy than uh, mastectomy. But don't get me wrong, there are situations whereby mastectomy is still the surgery of choice. Probably this is inflammatory breast cancer. It is locally advanced. It is multicentric. The patient has a, a BRCA mutation or other things. There are other indications that mastectomy is still the treatment of choice in such women. And these are discussions you should have with your oncologist and uh, surgeon. <laughs> Hormonal therapy, if the tumor uh, expresses uh, estrogen and uh, progesterone. Usually we use a drug like tamoxifen in younger women, uh, premenopausal and in postmenopausal women. Uh, we use uh, aromatase inhibitor. They block uh, because the estrogen is what feeds the cancer and makes it grow and spread. So the blocker prevents estrogen from attaching to the cancer cells. Uh, and there are other targeted therapies like the Atunil receptor blocker, and there are a few of them now uh, that we use. In 2015, we are a little beyond uh, hormone receptor blockers and Atunil blockers and blood in breast cancer. We are beginning to use other types of targets. They may not be mainstay, but some of them are already main, mainstay. Uh, like a drug called Ibrax. Uh, is a PAP inhibitor that we use uh, in metastatic cancer that is failing to respond to um, endocrine therapy like uh, aromatase inhibitor now. If I'm going into an area that you know you want me to explain a little, uh, but I think basically it's just that we are doing more than just the estrogen receptor blockers that we have for the last 30 years. We are, we are having some other uh, breakthroughs. So uh, how do we screen? There are at least three ways self-breast exam. The basic thing about that is know your breast, know if something is different. Um, and if you're married, your husband can know your breast also and know if something is different. Um, and I've had patients come to me and it's actually their husband that felt something different and I'm like, what are you doing there? <laughs> um, actually they should because there are times when people come in and this is not you know it's not funny because in 2015 people should not be coming in with fungating breast cancer and we see this once or twice every year when somebody come with fungating foul smelling breast cancer that is eating right, sometimes you almost see their chest wall. Uh, clinical breast exam, also this is done by physicians uh, yearly after the age of 40. And then mammograms, which we should be doing also yearly. Uh, we'll watch a YouTube video. 
Hey there, I'm Dr. Christy Funk, and I've joined Joe Play This Ball to encourage women and men to put their breast health first. A simple first step is getting to know what's normal for you through a breast self-exam, or BSE. Understanding how your breasts look and feel can help you recognize important changes. The process only takes a few minutes, and I recommend starting to check for changes regularly at age 20. Here are a few tips. First, do your BSE only once a month, one week after your period, when your breasts are less lumpy and not as tender. Or for you women without periods, do it on the first day of every month and mark it off on your calendar. Second, find a place where you're comfortable, like lying in bed or while in the shower. Finally, if you think it helps with your exam technique, use lotion or shower soap to help your fingers glide across your breast tissue. And now for the details of a BSE. Start by standing up and looking at your breast in the mirror for visual changes such as skin dimpling, nipple inversion, or color size and shape changes. Look straight ahead into that mirror with your hands on your hips, then push your hands into your hips to flex your chest muscles. Next, raise your arms directly overhead, watching those breasts for skin retraction or bulges. Now, whether on a bed or in the shower, lift one arm and place the pads of your three middle fingers of your opposite hand on the top outside corner of your breast like this. Press using first light, then medium, and finally firm pressure in a tiny circle without lifting those fingers off the skin. Move in an up and down pattern like this, or if you prefer, you can use radial lines like spokes on a wheel, or concentric circles like a target sign starting at the nipple moving outwards or horizontal lines like words on a page. But whatever you choose, do it the same way every month. Be sure to include up to your collarbone and into your armpit in your exam. And conclude your exam with a gentle squeezing pressure of the central breast to make sure that bloody or clear fluid does not emerge from your nipple. Any other color is fine. Then repeat on the other breast. Some changes you may notice during a breast self-exam could include a lump that you never felt before, diffuse swelling of the whole breast, breast skin thickening or redness, a nipple that is red, itchy, flaking, or turning inward, or a discharge that is not breast milk and is either bloody or clear with pressure, or is any color but comes out all by itself without pressure. Keep in mind that many times these changes do not mean you have breast cancer, but always consult your doctor if you notice a change in your breast. And most important, remember that a BSE should be conducted in addition to clinical screenings and mammograms offered by your doctor. Visit yourlidmatters.com to learn how you can join YoPlay in the fight against breast cancer. Um, so there is a little bit of confusion about when, what, especially with the uh, U.S. Preventive Task Force recommendation that came out in uh, 2004. Uh, but many of the professional bodies, including American Cancer uh, Society, the NCCN, the American College of uh, Surgeons and Radiologists, all uh, professionals that treat breast cancer don't really agree with, with this. Um, and we can go on and talk about this. Uh, but I will just give you these uh, recommendations uh, based on what is on the slide and say one or two things. We are almost done, so uh, bear with me, probably 10 more minutes. Um, so the breast self-exam, probably any woman in their 20s, uh, basically I always say be comfortable with your breasts, know how your breasts feel because you saw what is on the video. Uh, you have to be a very meticulous person to be able to remember all that all the time. Uh, once you are at the age of 40, you start doing uh, clinical, uh, head, clinical breast exam every three years for women in their 20s uh, and 30s and every year once you are above 40. The U.S. Preventive Task Force basically said mammogram every other year uh, at the age of uh, 50. My, and this is my uh, uh, 
personal opinion and many of the organizations is discuss with your physician what is best for you. But we think from the age of 40 onwards, you should do mammogram every year. And we've done studies that are published that with every year of mammogram means the likelihood of being diagnosed with a more advanced cancer is there or dying from breast cancer. And you think about it, if somebody doesn't do mammogram for two years, uh, none of this, uh, none of the mammogram or everything is perfect. So if you miss something in that two years, it may be another two years, so almost, maybe up to four years before, and by the time you start picking it up, it's more advanced, require more morbid surgeries and more morbid treatment. Um, so I pretty much uh, talked about knowing yourself. So what are the warning signs? We don't really want the warning signs. Uh, most of the time, uh, the breast cancer are diagnosed with warning signs, they are a little advanced. We want breast cancer to be diagnosed when they don't have any signs, it's just by screening. So there is a like you that is small and you can uh, treat it and when people present with inflammatory breast cancer signs and symptoms, big lump or signs of spread, uh, but if you're looking at things that will make you go to the doctor, if you feel a lot, if you have a contracture, if you have a change in size or shape, one breast uh, is a little bit hanging lower than the, than the other, redness, scaly discharge, especially bloody discharge, uh, you probably should see somebody. Bloody discharge does not always mean cancer. Many times it is papilloma. Uh, of the breast. Uh, there are some risk factors that are non-modifiable. So what are the risks for getting breast cancer? Number one risk is age. As people get older, their risk of breast cancer increases. Uh, dense breast, uh, probably because it's more difficult to detect uh, cancer, not necessarily that it's a dense breast will, will get uh, breast cancer. Helimenarche late menopause. That means the number of uninterrupted menses, uh, the longer, if you have more, then there is higher risk. There is a first degree relative, there is increased risk. And if you, if, if you have inherited mutation, we have many now, not just BRCA1 and 2, uh, there is CHEC2, uh, there is a hereditary gastric acid gene, and uh, and other genes that we look into now. Uh, if somebody has already has history of breast cancer, their risk increases a little. There are other lumps that can be in the breast that are not necessarily cancer, like what we call uh, they are cysts that the radiologist will aspirate and will go away. Uh, there are fibromas and there are fatty tissues too that can be seen. Uh, just one or two things about BRCA1 and 2 mutation. The one is probably the uh, most common. A woman can have up to 80% risk of breast cancer if they have BRCA1 mutation. Uh, but on average, it's about 45 to 50%. BRCA2 is less common. It's associated with ovarian cancer also. Uh, and most of these women will have breast cancer in their young age uh, and they can have bilateral involvement. And that's why many of the individuals that carry the gene were elect for uh, mastectomy. I already mentioned age, that the higher somebody, so the risk of breast cancer in someone in their 30 is 1 in 227. By the time you get to age 70, it's one in 26. So I've had people that say, oh, the person is older, they don't need mammogram, is the opposite. The older you get, once you still have good health, you should continue to do mammogram annually.
And I hear a lot of my older patients say, oh, well, my doctor said I don't need mammograms anymore. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> that's not true. Some of the modifiable risk factors, no full time pregnancies, not breastfeeding, uh, recent use of uh, contraceptives or more hormone replacement than contraceptive. The contraceptive is still uh, controversial. Alcohol consumption in excess, uh, cigarette use in excess. Well, all cigarette use is bad. So I'm not, I'm going to take out that excess from there. Um, being uh, excessively overweight and also lack of exercise. So this is probably getting to my last slide. So how can you reduce the risk of uh, breast cancer? There are some risk factors that are not modifiable, but those ones that I mentioned that are modifiable, uh, just do the opposite of them. Let's, you know, we've been talking about some myths, but these are others. So men can't get breast cancer false. Breast cancer is contagious, false. Mammogram can make breast spread false. I hear also that if they biopsy, is the cancer going to spread? And my answer is every single cancer has to be biopsy for you to make diagnosis. And then they say, oh, that's true. So it's, it's more or less a myth that you, you can't biopsy something. Annual mammogram exposes you to too much radiation that increase your risk of cancer. I don't think so. I'll say false too. Finding a lump always makes cancer false. Caffeine causes breast cancer. I'm going to say false, but again, if you do the research on anything, you pretty much can find whatever you want. Uh, but I don't think caffeine causes breast cancer. Your father's family history uh, doesn't affect your risk. That's not true. The genetic risk can be transferred from father to daughter. Antiperspirant and deodorant cause breast cancer falls. And I've had a patient that came to me and said, Doctor, I've been smelling a lot. Like, then the next thing she said is, because I don't use my deodorant, I said, so use it. He said, it causes breast cancer. <laughs> And I'm like, who told you that? He said, this doctor. I said, we're going to that doctor. He said, no, 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 no. You're going to. I said, no. Then when I went to the doctor, he said, no, I didn't tell her that. I told her that while we are doing radiation, don't use your deodorant. Uh, so people hear stuff and things like that. And uh, uh, if the gene mutation for PLCA1 or two percent, you will definitely develop breast cancer. It's not true. It's not hundred um, percent. What should I do when I leave today? Know your body. You may want to add a, a monthly breast self exam to your calendar and make more lifestyle changes uh, that will decrease the risk of breast cancer. We now have apps that can remind you about breast exams. Well, it looks like I have to stop here, but I'm sure we've had a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.